Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webisode on uh, PPP loans and what we have to prepare for uh, as borrowers. Uh, we're thrilled to have you all here today uh, and to be a part of this. And I hope you, you have seen and enjoyed uh, the work that we've done on behalf of the entire business community as it relates to COVID-19 and recovery, economic recovery. As a matter of fact, uh, for those of you listening, you should know that on Monday, um, pick up the Buffalo News and put on channel two and you'll hear about a big uh, public service uh, campaign that we are doing about keeping the economy open. Uh, today, uh, we've got an expert dream team from Hotch and Russ to really talk about the work and what you all have to do to prepare uh, as our, the PPP loans become due. So I'm going to ask uh, Rena, Jason, and Ben to sort of come on and introduce themselves and, um, and, and move on with the presentation so that we run on time today. Uh, and I just wanna thank all three of you for um, being with us and for um, sharing your expertise with, with all of our, our members. So Jason, why don't you kick us off? Sure, my name is Jason Markell. I'm a partner in the firm's business litigation department. Uh, I handle a wide variety of business and commercial matters and construction issues. And part of my practice also includes occupational safety and health compliance counseling for our clients who uh, experience those issues. Rena? Good morning, everyone. I'm Ritu Parnadatta. I go by Rena. It's a little bit easier. I'm also a litigator at Hodgson Russ. I do a lot of work with criminal defense as well as civil and criminal fraud allegations. Yes, good morning. I'm Ben Zuffranieri. I'm also a member of the firm's litigation group, having been at Hodgson Russ for now 36 years. Uh, I'm on the business litigation side of things and also do an extensive amount of construction litigation. Great, and with that, um, I guess we'll move into our presentation, Borrower Beware, um, Defending PPP Loans from After the Fact Government Scrutiny. Uh, some of you may have already attended other seminars relating to PPP loans. This one I think is going to be a little bit different than perhaps what you've heard before. We're not going to spend time undertaking a nuts and bolts discussion of the various complicated rules or how they apply to your specific situation. We will mention a few here and there where we're um, pertinent to the discussion. But really what we're presenting to you today is a litigation-based perspective on PPP loans and uh, specifically identifying things like borrower risks and how and why some of the issues that relate to the PPP loan program can lead to loan audits and litigation or even in some cases, criminal liability. Uh, we're also going to like, uh, identify a few likely subjects where PPE disputes uh, are, are more likely to arise and things that you can do today to try and mitigate those risks and begin preparing now to defend these loans should you ultimately face government scrutiny in one form or another. So if we start from the beginning, what is this program about? Um, the PPP program itself, oh, it looks like it skipped a slide on me. Um, the PPP program was incorporated into an existing program, the SBA's Section 7A Small Business Loan Program. And it did it by basically providing an overlay uh, to, to the existing statute, whereby it temporarily suspended something known as the credit elsewhere requirement. The credit elsewhere requirement would ordinarily prohibit or render ineligible businesses that can access or draw on other sources of credit. And for the time being, for purposes of, of this program, um, that has been suspended to allow a much broader based group of businesses to access money in the program. Um, but there are terms, there are conditions. Um, this isn't a program that uh, is free money. Uh, there's lots of terms, conditions, and evolving fine print, and the loan must be used uh, in a specific, number one, by an eligible borrower, and be used for designated purposes in a proper allocation ratio within a specified cover period, or it will not be forgivable. When you take a look at how this program evolved, um, it was hurriedly enacted at the very beginning 
uh, and it left open a lot of unanswered questions about how the program would work, long term, short term, etc. There was a lot of cleanup left to do after the fact, and some of it um, ended up restricting the program more. Some of it made the program a little bit broader. Um, and in the process of cleaning up, what we have seen is that the SBA and Treasury have issued all kinds of different guidance documents, updated final rules, FAQs. Congress itself amended the program back in June to address a number of different issues. And what this really means is that the rules and requirements continue to be written after the fact, in some cases months after you've applied and accepted your money under these programs. Some of the rules are retroactive, some of them are not. And to date, what you see is there have been 23 different interim final rules since April. There's been an 18 page FAQ that has 49 Q and A's. There's a new FAQ that came out about two weeks ago that addresses forgiveness issues. And so there's a lot of complexity and nuance to this about what applies, what controls your particular loan, how you do calculations, um, some of these rules have three different effective dates even in them, depending upon which portion of the rule you're talking about. So these things can be very difficult to get through and understand in a complete way and try to apply it for a borrower. Well, let's talk about forgiveness because the applications are already in. The deadline came back on August 8th. And so now forgiveness is the real topic of discussion. And um, one of the things that you have to think about here is the compliance with all of these rules really gets evaluated more so on the forgiveness end because there was no real front end underwriting process. People filled out certifications, they submitted them, and the borrowers, uh, you know, the loans were based upon certifications. So on the forgiveness side, uh, the process again looks backward at what has been submitted as well as what has happened to you in terms of your process over the past few months. The borrower submits that application initially to its lender, uh, and, and many of you uh, may be confronting circumstances where right now, technically the, the period for submission is open, but many of your lenders are not yet accepting these applications. And so, you know, your situation may differ, but uh, fundamentally the applications all should include this basic information that we've outlined here uh, most of it's just documentation of the expenses and payroll and things like that. But there's a, part, a, a section of this that talks about how your application process will include any other documentation the administrator or SBA deems necessary. Now we'll talk about the implications of that going forward, but a lot of this may seem simpler than it really is. The quality of your data is going to be important and putting together the, the detailed information for your sub submission is, is significant. So when and how should you submit your application, assuming you have the ability to do so anytime soon? There are, of course, technical rules to submit at any time before maturity, as long as you've used up the loan proceeds. But you must apply within 10 months uh, after your covered period ends, or you have to start repaying it. Uh, while that submission is, is being considered, your repayment is in deferral. So, you know, timing can be important for some businesses. It may be something that you think about what's best for you at a given point in time. Um, and sometimes this question comes up, what's the best time? Well, there is no real best time. It's a specific issue that is, that is going to be client specific, uh, circumstance driven. There may be rules that have changed your loan from the time you applied until now. There may be things you can do perhaps that you couldn't do before to maximize forgiveness. Um, and you also wanna think about, am I a likely target for an audit or review based upon the nature of my business, the size of my loan or something else that would suggest maybe some additional care should be taken now to uh, prepare for that eventuality. You also wanna be mindful in these circumstances as you're submitting information that could at some point uh, potentially be sought after. And so freedom of information laws may come into play with some information and you should take the time to protect information if it's sensitive by marking it appropriately and trying to use the FOIA disclosure exemptions. So how does the process work after that with the lender? 
the lender is going to conduct an initial review of these applications, what's known as a good faith review, and reasonably rely upon the material that the borrower submits. The lender is primarily or, or mostly protected through this process because the SBA guarantees the loan. Um, and, and the lender is allowed to rely upon the material that's provided. All of the burden and all of the uh, responsibility for the accuracy of the information falls to the borrower. Uh, once the information is reviewed, the lender can do a couple of things. They can approve it, either in whole or in part, deny it with specified reasons, uh, deny it because the SBA may have already initiated a review, uh, and in which case, if there's an adverse decision by the loan or, or by the, the lender, you can request SBA review. But if the lender ultimately approves and requests payment from the SBA, uh, there's a period of 90 days in which that money is supposed to be paid. I think in many cases that leads to a false sense of security for the borrower, believing that if the money has been paid by the SBA back to the bank, they're in the clear. But that really isn't the case because these loans are subject to SBA review pretty much at any time. And it can be long after that, that um, submission is made or the money even paid back to the bank. So what is an SBA review audit process going to look like? The SBA has come out and said, we're going to basically review three things, borrower eligibility, loan amounts, and use of proceeds, and the loan forgiveness about, amount. The most significant piece of this is that if a borrower is deemed ineligible, there will be no portion of that loan forgiven. And that's significant um, and can be uh, have a significant impact on, on the business itself. For the other issues, the loan amount or the proceeds or the forgiveness amount, there may be some errors there, but that doesn't necessarily eliminate your entirety of the, of the forgiveness amount. It will be adjusted according to what can be forgiven based upon the amount uh, justified by the documents. But borrowers, and particularly those who uh, took a loan more than $2 million, are at very high risk for an audit. And they should begin preparing today on how they would defend that loan from audit and whether they can substantiate all of those elements and particularly the eligibility requirements. Uh, as I said, all loans over, you know, there will be audits. All loans over $2 million will be reviewed and audited. Um, that doesn't mean that people with smaller loans uh, get a free pass. It just means that, um, you know, there's still discretion by the PPP, uh, I'm sorry, the SBA to review those loans but it won't be as automatic. Um, there are a number of different types of businesses that are probably in the high risk category beyond the $2 million. These are laid out here in the, in the slide for you. But the question often comes up again, when will this review happen? As I said, the 90 day period isn't dispositive of that issue. And the SBA has very clearly said it can review a loan of any size at any time in its discretion. And that makes a lot of sense if you think about how the program was put together. Uh, everything's reviewed from hindsight. There wasn't underwriting. Uh, the time and political pressures associated with the, this program make it impossible to really have done that kind of review on the front end. Um, the other thing that suggests a long-term horizon for this is the document retention requirement which suggests, uh, you know, it says that you have to keep your materials for six years after the forgiveness or repayment. And that implies a longer term horizon to be reviewing the material or being subjected to an audit. So you're not out of the woods just because the bank got its money back. What might that audit look like? Well, probably what you would think it would look like for the most part, which is reviewing all the materials, the certifications, the calculations, all the, all the different pieces of the puzzle that you submitted. Uh, but it's also important to know that the SBA has the ability to conduct supplemental investigations in its discretion. They can ask for more information. Uh, they have pre-existing powers to subpoena anywhere in the country. Um, there's also some, some language that talks about voluntary submission of materials. You may be uh, in certain circumstances interested in submitting something as an explanatory piece of material. Uh, and I think Ben will touch upon some of those issues and the implications later. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. Eligibility though, as I said, is, is the critical one. There's a lot of different sub issues associated with this. Everything from 
the type of business, some of which are ineligible by statute, including other regs outside of the PPP program, headcount issues, how you count people, eligibility issues on the corporate side, affiliation rules, even some criminal issues. Uh, the one big one that is going to be a focus of Ben's later is the necessity certification and good faith requirement, which is a potential source of uh, some real confusion as well as uh, some risk for borrowers of these loans. Uh, as I said, consequences of eligibility, if you are deemed ineligible, uh, the loan will not be forgiven. But there's a further implication of perhaps greater significance to some, which is if that borrower ultimately defaults, who pays that loan back? And uh, the statute is set up in a way that it provides protection for shareholders, members, and partners of a borrower, but only if the borrower is eligible and the proceeds are used for approved purposes. So if the borrower um, defaults on these loans, there are circumstances where personal liability can be triggered uh, and the SBA could pursue people individually to recover loan proceeds. There's also issues with permissible and forgivable use of the proceeds. The SBA outlines a number of different um, uses of the money in Section 7A, but the PPP uses are much narrower. And they're listed here as, there's about seven, six, seven items here in which you can use PPP monies. But then there's a, a, another narrower category, which is forgivable uses, because not every permissible use is a forgivable use. And we point this out primarily to demonstrate that there are issues that you need to be really careful with in what you're identifying for purposes of your forgiveness application, that you are not seeking to recover, in from, in, recover for money spent on something that may be a permissible use, but is not a forgivable use. Uh, so you need to be careful with that and make sure that your documentation is appropriate and supports uh, what the forgiveness elements allow you to recover. Other areas where forgiveness can come into question, you know, there's a number of different calculations about how you determine salary and wage deductions, reductions, um, head counts, all kinds of different compensation issues about owner compensation. Um, there's issues with safe harbors calculating, uh, you know, restored wages, restored employees. One of the most important elements of all of these things though, is if you are looking to um, use a safe harbor or a forgiveness cure, you really need to make sure you have the appropriate backup documentation to support these things and include it um, in your submissions. So let's assume at some point the SBA issues a decision and it is adverse. Do you have a right to appeal? Well, we've been waiting for months for the SBA to, to really explain how this process will work. And they finally issued an interim final rule last week that summarizes what the process will be. It's still out for public comment, so there could be some amendments to it. And I would expect perhaps there will be. But the general process, uh, as you might imagine, is not terribly favorable for borrowers. It could be a long and difficult road to challenge one of these things. but one thing you really need to keep in mind is that if you are filing an appeal, you do not get a deferral period for the repayment of the loan. You need to start repaying that right away. Now the process itself um, can be complicated. It's a multi-step process that starts from the initial adverse decision. You've got an appeal process to what's known as the Office of Hearings and Appeals, an opportunity to perhaps request reconsideration, but then there's yet a further administrative review by the administrator if um, you're unsatisfied with the SBA decision, and you need to satisfy all of that before you can go to a court and seek final updates. Um, the big issue here among those hurdles is the burden of proof. The borrower clearly has a hefty burden of proof on these things to show by a preponderance of evidence that the loan review decision issued by the SBA was based on clear error of fact or law. That's going to be a challenge uh, in part because that standard is typically very high, but also what's included in your record um, may be much narrower than, than uh, you might think it is. 
And it's pretty clear, at least at this point, that there's going to be some confusion over how we deal with the record going forward because information that is before the SBA is generally what is considered part of the record. But um, there may be other issues that, that arise in the context of this that Ben's gonna to touch upon where you may not really have a great opportunity to make those submissions. Um, also think about the confidentiality issues because these will be public decisions and you may need to seek a protective order or otherwise in order to keep some of that information out of the public eye. Uh, the process itself we've outlined here, I don't wanna talk about it in great level of detail, but the borrower is the one withstanding it to appeal. And remember, we just talked about the non-recourse provision here. If the borrower doesn't take the appeal um, and there's potential individual liability exposure, the individual owners don't have standing to take that appeal. And that has implications um, you know, where there's a loan default. The time for filing these appeals is also very short. You only have 30 days after review of the decision. And for the most part, the submission of the things that go with the appeal are fairly straightforward, except for what I've identified here as number three, which is a full and specific statement as to why the SBA loan review decision is alleged to be erroneous, together with all supporting factual information and legal arguments. Well, that could be a lot to pull together in a 30-day time period if you're not preparing for some of these issues in advance and don't have your ducks in order. And so, uh, again, it's another hurdle that the SBA is putting there on these appeals that um, you, know, you need to think about in advance a little bit. Uh, the appeals themselves are, are being decided uh, on the record. And so uh, that's something to think about too. Uh, at this point, I'll pass it over to Ben and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Well, um, I'm gonna talk about the litigation process itself. And I often say that litigation attorneys are like undertakers. We're the last group business clients wanna call, but when they need us, they usually really need us. And um, hopefully you won't need us, but we're concerned and believe that the potential for PPP litigation is significant. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that litigation will likely involve. Um, everybody who has such a loan knows that this is a unique program. And as Jason discussed, is really layered with complexity and ambiguity. And because of that, we think the potential for litigation is high. As Jason mentioned, litigation is most likely to be over eligibility and forgiveness standards. Now there could well also be litigation, but, it, but much less likely over computations and you know, whether satisfactory evidence has been submitted uh, in terms of um, the quality of the information. But the reason I think that litigation is likely is because an adverse ruling on eligibility may have dire consequences for borrowers who've already spent the money and structured their business affairs anticipating forgiveness. It could well be bet the company litigation. And most litigation I think will revolve around the necessity certification and SBA guidance, incorporating broad eligibility standards and subjective concepts including good faith. And in the next slide, I'm gonna identify um, that broad language. The, oops, excuse me. The language that we're concerned about is first the statutory language, which makes clear that borrowers need to be prepared to demonstrate facts and circumstances proving that the uncertainty of current economic conditions make necessary the loan request to support ongoing operations. And then there is uh, a number of guidance items which bear on this point that speak to the good faith nature of the certification necessarily taking into account current business activity and the ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support ongoing operations in a manner not significantly detrimental to the business. And many of you will recall 
the big flap when Ruth Chris and Shake Shack received um, loans. There was a big outcry and the SBA made clear that public companies would be, you know, in the crosshairs of litigation. And then later guidance made clear that this same guidance, FAQ 31, is going to apply to private companies. And so uh, anybody in the audience that as a private company is going to be subject to these standards. And these standards raise a number of questions. And the reason I quoted the language is this, you know, what degree of uncertainty needs to exist to demonstrate good faith and to qualify uh, for el loan eligibility and uh, forgiveness? You know, how is the uncertainty to be measured? You know, will there be an examination of the actual financial impacts on a business? Will it, that examination be solely of revenue or of profit? You know, what will that examination look like? There simply is no guidance on that point. Um, there's been a proposal for a second round of PPP money to be made available to small businesses. And I think Congress identified or recognized the vagueness of the first standard because the a proposal that exists now is a business might be eligible for a second loan if their revenue impacts were more than 50%. Well, you know, that standard is not in the original statute. And what period of time will the SBA look at to determine whether your business was impacted? Will it be solely at the time of the application, will it be Q1 of 2020 or Q2 of 2020 or possibly both? The current proposal for the second round of PPP would allow business to choose any of those three, Q1, Q2, excuse me, Q2 or both. And yet it's not clear in the first um, program what period of time they're going to be looking at. And when would accessing potential sources of liquidity becomes sufficiently detrimental that they don't need to be accessed. There is no standard. What levels of available liquidity are disqualifying? Um, we don't have any objective criteria. There are no formulas relating to cash flows, to debt service obligations, to leverage. We simply don't know. And the FAQ 31, which I included in the earlier slide, appears to contradict in a very imprecise way the CARES Act waiver of the credit elsewhere requirement. And I think many businesses are rightfully concerned and are, are fearful of how aggressive or how lenient the government's going to be in interpreting these standards two, three, four, five years from now when both the political and the economic environment may be very different. So what we do know is that the testing of the necessity certification is going to be very fact specific inquiry. The language speaks to borrowers demonstrating facts and circumstances. And so a borrower is going to need to have objective evidence that supports the good faith belief of eligibility and need. And the preservation of that evidence regarding business activity, cash flows, sources and extent of potential liquidity, operational needs, regulatory and industry impacts is essential. And as Jason mentioned, borrowers are going to have only 30 days to submit petitions challenging loan review decisions. So let me take a couple of examples that um, we've seen in our practice um, to demonstrate how this uncertainty and the ambiguity in the rules may lead to litigation and how that can vary from business to business and industry to industry. And I want to talk first about manufacturing company X. And I call that company the successful pivot from very substantial potential losses 
the financial stability and success. And I'm hearing from a lot of clients that um, they have seen this story play out before. Now this manufacturing company lost 50% of its uh, automotive client business in the first six weeks of the pandemic hitting. And this company was able to pivot from potential financial ruin to being able to make um, personal protective equipment. And um, the company went from potential bankruptcy to financial stability and success. And when and how the government looks at that company um, will make a huge difference because at the end of 12 months, there may be no revenue loss. Net profits may be as good or better than the prior year. And yet that PPP loan permitted that company to make the successful pivot. And you know we're hearing from many of our clients that they expected worse and that they've done better than they expected. And you know you may well be in that same position. And um, so these broad standards, you know, give everyone pause for concern. Construction company Y is another good example of how the cover of the book can be misleading. If you looked at the financial statement of that company, there appeared to be apparent liquidity on the books. And yet that company had debt covenant obligations and had responsibilities to its bonding company. And it had related businesses that had cross default provisions. And so what was apparent liquidity was not actual liquidity. And I'm concerned that um, a reviewer may not peel back the onion to understand what happened for these businesses and simply looking at financial statement or other information can lead to a loan denial where there should not be a denial. So this is the most important slide of my presentation. Jason said before you have 30 days to prepare a petition to challenge a loan review denial. But even before that, if there is an audit, you should have collected and you should have available a memo that has pulled together the information and data behind the loan certification. What was management thinking about when it's certified in good faith that that money was needed? You should do that memorandum now because three, four or five years from now, you're gonna forget important facts. You're gonna forget things that impacted your business. You need to carefully measure inefficiencies and impacts of required mitigation measures on your business. You should have collect, you should collect data now which measures those inefficiencies and impacts. Obviously, you'll want to have records of lost business, but you'll also want records of delayed business and how there were periods where the cash flows were not as you anticipated and maybe that you had budgeted. You're going to track um, your aging. You should be tracking the aging of your receivables, and you should have that information available. Certainly, you'll be collecting information on lost receivables. Price concessions demanded by your customers. Collect the emails now. Financial sacrifices made by ownership, management, and employees will help, I think, influence a reviewer on whether that loan was necessary. Obviously, you're going to want to also perform loan covenant testing. You're going to look at cross default provisions and lending agreements. You're going to want to pull this information together. The next point is this. Submit that documentation at the earliest opportunity. If you are audited, if you receive an inquiry regarding eligibility, you want to submit that to the SBA. Why? because the rules are un unclear on when the borrowers can demonstrate facts supporting their eligibility and loan forgiveness. At some point, the record will be closed. In a literal reading of the rules Jason talked about earlier, 
indicate that um, litigation will include only what the SBA had before it when it made its determination. Pull together the information now, do yourself a favor, be prepared to make a compelling case. So I pulled a couple of um, pieces together here, communications demonstrating uncertainty and liquidity constraints. Every one of these, of your businesses have emails like this from customers and entities that owed you money and that needed time to pay. Three and four years from now, you're gonna struggle to find this email if you're audited three years from now. But if you collect it now, you'll be able to show that your business was impacted. In this particular email, you know, the client is promising that they're good for the money. But at the height of the pandemic, you did not know whether your clients would be good for your money. You didn't know what customers might fail. Many of you also have forbearance communications and agreements where parties were had no choice and were forced to agree on forbearance. Collect it now. It goes to the issues of liquidity. It goes to the issues of eligibility. You will need that. Collect some industry information. I pulled one from the legal profession, which, you know, there's a lot of publication, no matter what industry you're in, which will talk about the impact on the of the pandemic on your industry. Collect it now um, and collect that information both at the height of the pandemic and closest to date of the loan certification. So um, here's the takeaways. Prepare now to meet audit examination and to challenge denials. Lay the groundwork for successful demonstration of eligibility and forgiveness. Talk about what that requires, identifying impacts, identifying market and industry data, collecting key evidence before it's lost. You have only a brief period to do that. The burden of proving eligibility is on you. Hope for the best and prepare for the worst. What's coming next is uncertain. Thank you, I'll turn it over to Rena now. Hello again, everyone. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about potential investigations and enforcement actions relating to fraud in the PPP outside of the SBA context. Uh, now, Jason mentioned the $2 million SBA threshold below which borrowers may not necessarily be audited by the SBA. But it's important to note that that's a guideline that binds only the SBA and not the many other federal agencies that have the jurisdiction to investigate this program. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, there's a lot of them. Um, so really the question of how aggressive investigation and enforcement is gonna be, I think, depends on the political will of these agencies to do so. And I put up on this slide just a collection of recent news articles around the program. And I think what it shows is that there's a general public perception that the funds from this program didn't necessarily get to the small businesses and the lower income workers that it was intended to help. And I think if this perception persists, we're likely to see very aggressive investigations and attempts to claw back the funds to sort of quote undeserving recipients. I want to just point out that top uh, bullet point, the article on Potbelly. Uh, it's a recent article. I would encourage everyone to take a minute or two to, to read through it because it's a little bit instructive, I think, on how important it is to be mindful of public communications uh, regarding your business if you receive these loans. Now, Potbelly, it's a very big company. It's publicly traded. It initially got a $10 million PPP loan in April, and it returned it when that initial tranche of funding ran out and, and under pressure uh, from the public because there was a lot of small businesses that, that didn't get any funding. It then recently applied again for another $10 million loan, which it received. Uh, and interestingly, kind of two days before, uh, during a second quarter earnings call, uh, it made a number of very optimistic statements about revenues and concerns being resolved. Uh, and those statements juxtaposed against the $10 million loan uh, create some, I think, a perception that perhaps they didn't really need it. 
And there's any number of reasons as to why that's not the case and why those statements can be perfectly harmonized with the receipt of that loan. But I think it just shows that you have to be very mindful as to what it is that you're saying about your business, who's hearing it, whose attention it's going to get, uh, because you can bet that regulators are reading these articles too. So one of the government's most uh, important and effective weapons for fighting fraud on the civil end is the False Claims Act. This is a statute that was actually enacted during the Civil War and intended to prevent fraud on the Union troops. Uh, but it could have been written for the PPP program. It sort of fits with it so, so closely. Basically, the statute imposes liability on those who present or cause to be presented a false or fraudulent claim for payment or approval. Now that causes to be presented language is very important because it brings within the net of potential liability those who didn't necessarily sign the application or make the certifications in the applications. Uh, it can encompass anyone who helped prepare it, who helped facilitate it, who put together the documentation to support it. So it's, it's really a, a wide range of, of folks that can be brought in under the statute. It also imposes liability on those who use false records or false statements material to a claim conspire to commit a violation or avoid or decrease an obligation to repay money to the government. And of course, that's in this context would be a forgiveness application trying to avoid repayment of the PPP loan. A claim is defined as any request or demand for money or property, and it doesn't have to be made to the government. It can be made to a recipient of government funds uh, if the funds are being used to advance a government program and the government ultimately reimburses those funds, which again is, is exactly the case here. So we can expect we're, we're going to see a lot of False Claims Act cases brought under this program. And this is a really effective weapon for the government for a number of reasons. The first being that uh, to be liable under it, you don't have to intend to defraud anyone. You don't have to have that, that uh, sort of motivation to get something you're not entitled to. Uh, the statute allows enforcement actions against those who act recklessly or, the, or those who are deliberately ignorant of their circumstances. And this is important because intent to defraud really is an inquiry as to the borrower's state of mind. Recklessness really gets to the question of, were you reasonable? And, and do I think that you were reasonable looking at this situation after the fact and perhaps years after it happened? Uh, so it's a, a broad standard and imposes liability even in cases that you don't typically think of as being fraudulent. Now under the statute, the government can claim not only the amount of damages it sustained by paying out, you know, in this context, the PPP loan, but three times that amount as well as a per claim penalty. So a $2 million PPP loan can lead to a $6 million recovery for the government. So again, there's a lot of incentive to really use this statute. Uh, to, to go after damages. The statute also allows private individuals or whistleblowers to bring an action on behalf of the government and obtain a portion between 15 to 30 percent of any recovery. So instead of dealing with a limited number of regulators with limited resources and budgets, there's any number of private individuals who, who think they may have connected the dots and may be incentivized to uh, bring a case under this statute and get a portion of that recovery. There's also a very long statute of limitations under this statute uh, that can go up to 10 years. So we could be looking at potential actions under the statute at 20 in 2030, uh, which is a long time to be, to be worried about that liability. Now this slide just has some excerpts of a speech uh, from Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Ethan Davis, uh, where he makes clear that the Department of Justice is going to be using the False Claims Act and intends to, kind of quote, energetically enforce it uh, in the context of the PPP. But something he also says here, which I think is important, is that he's, he's recognizing that this is a not a normal time, that this program is not a normal program. There's a lot of complicated guidance and rules surrounding it, and as such, enforcement is really going to focus on sort of, quote, knowing violations that are material to the government's payment decisions. And the question of materiality, I think, is an important one, because we're still trying to figure out what it is that's really important to the government's payment decisions. Ben talked a little bit about the necessity certification. I think it's safe to say that that's going to be material. Uh, but what else is? Uh, one of the interesting open questions, I think, under this issue is, is whether all of the guidance documents, the FAQs, which are not statutes, they are not regulations, whether those are going to be considered to be material to the government's payment decisions and whether a violation of that 
typically non-binding agency guidance uh, can in and of itself predicate a violation of law. Something interesting to note is that the Trump administration uh, in 2018 had said that it was not going to be using agency guidance uh, as a predicate for a legal obligation. So, for example, if you violate a provision in, in one of the hundreds of Medicare manuals somewhere, that in and of itself doesn't mean you violated the law. But in the context of this program, where so much of the parameters are defined by non-binding, or I should say so-called non-binding agency guidance, uh, it's going to be interesting to see whether that remains the case. So that should be on everyone's radar and something to keep an eye on. So worse, of course, than civil fraud liability is the possibility of criminal liability. And there are any number of redundant criminal statutes that the government can use to prosecute what they believe to be improper uh, receipt of PPP funds. And something, uh, excuse me, what, one thing to keep in mind about criminal liability is that it does impose a higher burden on the government. The government typically has to show that the defendant in that case had the intent to defraud or was willfully making false statements. But the government does not have to show success. In other words, uh, for example, the wire fraud statute criminalizes the scheme to defraud with the intent to defraud. It doesn't necessarily criminalize a successful scheme. So you don't necessarily have to get PPP funds to be criminally liable for wire fraud or false statement to the government. You just have to try to do so. So it's a, a broad based liability from that perspective. So just a couple more quotes on this slide from the Department of Justice. It's clear that they are looking out for fraudulent uh, disbursements of PPP funds. They're encouraging the public to report fraud and US attorneys have been directed to prioritize fraud in this context. Uh, and we know that the Department of Justice has been reaching out to lenders and the SBA in not only approved applications, but rejected ones as well to look for red flags that may predicate a prosecution. So it's, it's happening in the background. So I put on here just a couple examples of the initial uh, allegations that have been brought under the PPP on, for criminal charges. And these are really, I think, can be classified as sort of the low hanging fruit. They're, they're very obviously wrong and they were probably very easy to see that they were uh, to, uh, to catch by the government to see that something fraudulent was going on here. So for example, in the July 13th, 2020 uh, indictment, uh, the uh, or excuse me, the borrower submitted two different sets of IRS documents, one set to the IRS and one to the uh, lender to obtain the PPP loans. That's, that's an easy catch for the government, uh, not too much enforcement or not too much uh, resources required there. What's also interesting about that particular uh, allegation is that it only involved $400,000 in PPP loans. That's of course well below the SBA $2 million threshold uh, and even in run-of-the-mill federal prosecutions, that's a relatively small amount. Uh, so I think it's signaling that it, you don't necessarily have to obtain a large amount of, of PPP funding to be potentially in the government crosshairs. I also want to point out the August 6, 2020, uh, it's actually a guilty plea. I believe this is the first guilty plea uh, under the PPP program. And you'll see that this case was investigated by a number of different federal agencies all working together, including the DOJ, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Oklahoma, the Federal Housing Finance Agency Inspector General, the FDIC, and the SBA. So I think this signals a lot of federal agency cooperation as far as investigation and enforcement action, uh, and the fact that a lot of different agencies are, are all having their uh, resources focused on this program. So the next two slides are the various certifications from the borrower and forgiveness applications. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you should certainly read them. And should also make sure that you have documentation to support each of them and that you really understand what they mean and, and what the requirements of the program are even after you've submitted your application. Because as Jason mentioned, the rules change. Sometimes the changes are made retroactive, sometimes not. Uh, so it's really important that you understand what it is you've certified, what it is you've agreed to, uh, and if there's an issue to make sure you correct it. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we've learned from the past. And, and our last sort of large government program dispersing funds into the economy was the TARP program, the Trouble Assets Relief Program. 
Uh, that, of course, was created in 2008 at the beginning of the Great Recession. Uh, and that program created uh, the office of SIGTARP, the Special Inspector General of the TARP program. Uh, and this office was charged with auditing and investigating the, per uh, excuse me, the purchase management and sale of assets under TARP. And what's really interesting about this office is, is first of all, that it still exists uh, over 10 years later. And I would encourage everyone to take a look at their website because it's, it's really a masterclass in federal agency PR. Uh, and they talk a lot about all their successes in securing convictions and securing recoveries, almost 400 convictions, recoveries of more than 11 billion, and their partnership with many other civil and criminal law enforcement agencies, including state agencies. And one thing I find interesting about SIGTARP is that if you look through their, uh, their enforcement actions in which they were involved, uh, they only have, in some cases, a tangential, relief, or tangential connection excuse me, to the TARP program. For example, there was a number of uh, criminal prosecutions surrounding Omni National Bank. It was a bank that was headquartered in Atlanta uh, with which SIGTARP was involved. And this bank applied for but did not receive TARP funds. Uh, and I think the lesson there is that by, by opening yourself up to the government, by submitting information and documentation, uh, you are putting yourself in, in sort of the crosshairs of a number of different agencies who, who may not be necessarily concerned with PPP funds, but are taking the opportunity or, or, t or have the information presented that suggests other issues. So in the Omni example, uh, there were a number of convictions and guilty pleas relating to overvaluing bank assets uh, and kickbacks in, con in connection with certain construction loans that had nothing to do with TARP. Uh, so something to, to keep in mind. Now the CARES Act, uh, using the model of SIGTARP, created the office of SIGPR, the Special Inspector General Pandemic Recovery. Uh, and this office has the same general uh, mandate as SIGTARP did. It's supposed to audit and investigate funds dispersed under the act. Uh, it has the ability to issue subpoenas, it can execute search warrants, and it has to report to the Department of Justice if it believes or if it reasonably believes there has been a violation of criminal law. So this is a new office, of course. It hasn't had a chance to do much yet, uh, but we know it has been reaching out to U.S. attorney's offices. It has been starting to partner uh, and share resources for investigations. Uh, so we are likely to see soon, I think, uh, more coming out of this office. So in sum, whether you're responding to an SBA audit, a subpoena, a whistleblower complaint, uh, and by the way, you might not necessarily know what it is you are responding to. Uh, many prosecutors will use uh, SBA uh, subpoenas or subpoenas from other agencies uh, to hide the fact that there is a False Claims Act case or a criminal investigation ongoing. So any inquiry that you get about PPP funds or how they're being used, uh, including, by the way, from, from employees or from people that aren't necessarily associated with the government because they could be whistleblowers or they could be working with the government. So every inquiry you get, it's really important to take it very seriously uh, and prepare to do that now. And you do that now by making sure you understand the rules that were applicable, both at the time you submitted the application and the forgiveness request and what happens next. If, if something changes and that change applies retroactively, you have to make sure you understand it and understand how it affects your ability uh, to have gotten the funds and to have gotten forgiveness if you did. Uh, as Ben said, it's extremely important to make sure you have contemporaneous documentation uh, to support everything that you've done as far as this program, including all of the certifications that you've made. And it's important to make sure that documentation is relative or is easily available uh, next year or five years or 10 years after you got those funds to make sure you're, you can prove up and, and prove that, what your, that your actions in connection with this program were, were reasonable. And of course, if you do, if something does come to your attention, uh, suggesting that your circumstances are changed or that information you submitted was not 100% correct, uh, consider whether you need to make an appropriate disclosure or corrective statement to the SBA or the lender. Uh, you get your opportunity in that context to make your best case as to why that change didn't affect your eligibility for funds or your forgiveness of those funds. Uh, if, if they come to you with questions, you're going to be in a much more defensive and difficult position uh, and may not have the same opportunity to, to make your case as to why that change didn't matter.
So if you have questions, please reach out to any of us. We will go through some of the Q&A right now, uh, but to the extent we can't get to your question, please do reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to you. Yeah, Rena, I want to make sure that we're, we end on our scheduled time. So if we don't have time to get to all the questions, there are a few in there. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that we will uh, we will follow up after the webinar on each of those questions. And if you have a question you haven't asked yet, you can always use the business link web form on uh, the partnerships website. So go ahead, uh, Rena, and if you can take as many questions as we can get in in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we will do our best, and I am... All right, so we have a question about, should the memo on the basis for the certification be prepared with direction of counsel and be considered as attorney-client confidential? Uh, ben, is this one that you wanna take? Well, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think certainly your certification memo uh, would be more complete and likely um, touch on the critical points if you get advice from your attorney and your accountant. Uh, and if there's a conversations with the attorney about that, um, I would take the position that they are confidential and their attorney client privilege because the requesting and the rendering of legal advice is the test for privilege. So I think it would, m many clients would be well served uh, to have their uh, attorney assistant. Great. Um, I think we also got a question about paying 1099s and whether they are forgivable. Uh, Jason? Yeah, let me, let me take that one. Um, I'm assuming the question relates to treating them as employees. And the SBA has come out with specific guidance um, early on, I think back in April, as well as in the FAQ that uh, very clearly says that you do not treat a 1099 as an employee for purposes of the calculations. And so um, that's in part because a 1099 has the ability to apply for its own loan. So you may wanna go back and read through the FAQ. Uh, I believe the guidance that's applicable is, is the interim guidance in April. Um, so if that's, you know, if, if that's where you're headed with your forgiveness application, that's something you need to take a closer look at. Great. And we also have a question about whether there's a template available with regard to the memo that should be prepared. Ben, do you want to handle that one? Sure. Um, there is not. And I think the um, reason that um, a single template wouldn't work is, you know, each business and each industry is different. And I think um, how your business has been impacted, how your industry has been impacted, what ways you have been impacted will vary from business to business and industry to industry. You know, are, for example, you know, the regulations that, you know, have impacted your production, et cetera. So the, the short answer to the question is no. Well, we're, we're out of time. Uh, there are a couple of requests for copies of the presentation, and I do want to tell uh, uh, everyone who's listening that we will be sending out a recording of this presentation to all of you, so you will be able to see the slides uh, as well. And I just really want to uh, thank Rena, Jason, and Ben for your very, very, very thorough uh, presentation at a time when there is so much uncertainty uh, as it relates to this. So, uh, th and thank you for offering to assist people who have further questions. So we will, we will definitely uh, be back in touch with, uh, there's, I think there's one outstanding question here uh, and we'll be back in touch. And I, again, wanna thank, thank you all very, very much for doing this. Great, thanks for everyone for Bye attending. Everyone. Take care.